One of the first things that John announced when he saw Jesus, we find in John chapter 1, verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You know, Jesus has a great many roles to play in the work of salvation. I suppose that's one of the ways we can measure the greatness of any man is how much he contributes to the work of God. And Jesus has a great many things that he gives to the work. But when it comes to the cross of Christ, when it comes to making intercession for the transgressors, when it comes to making an end of sins, when it comes to satisfying the righteous indignation of God, being the lamb comes to the top. Behold the lamb of God. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. The lamb of God. When I got into this and started looking at the likenesses of Jesus' death, it was amazing. There are quite a number of traits that are in a lamb that we find, of course, in the Savior. Of course, as, as we know, Sister Nikki brought this to us a long time ago, that when God made creation, everything he made, he made to depict it the work of salvation so that people that had understanding could see these things. And there are a lot of great qualities in a lamb that we see in Jesus. So I'm just going to highlight one today. And that is this, that Jesus was harmless and defenseless. If Jesus was going to save you, he couldn't save you as the King of kings and Lord of lords. He would have done that without any kind of humility at all. He could have done that from heaven as God. He, could, he wouldn't have had to become a man then if he could save you. He couldn't save you with power and in great strength. He had to save you by humbling himself and making himself weak. He had to make himself defenseless or he'd have never been taken at all, as we'll see. He had to voluntarily humble himself if sins were going to be put away. Behold the Lamb of God. Psalm chapter 44, verse 9 through 11, we find this aspect of the sheep depicted in a number of aspects of Scripture, that the sheep is harmless and defenseless. And I'm just going to give you a few of these, and then we'll particularly highlight Jesus. Sometimes God judges his people. David highlighted some of those judgments, and he said, Thou hast cast off and put us to shame, and goest not forth with our armies. Thou makest us to turn back from the enemy. And they which hate us spoil for themselves. Thou hast given us like sheep appointed for meat and hast scattered us among the heathen. See, when God didn't go to the armies, go with the armies to the battle, it didn't matter how big or small it was. They didn't win. Why? Because from the higher perspective, they didn't have any defenses. They didn't have any way of overcoming their enemy because... Their defenses had, in fact, departed. That's being like a sheep, see? Jesus was like that. Or how about this one, this use of sheep in Psalm 78, 52 to 53? This is actually referring to a great triumph when Israel came out of Egypt. God refers to them as sheep. It says, but he made his own people to go forth like sheep. That's an interesting word to speak of the great triumphant way in which they came out of Egypt and guided them in the wilderness like a flock and he led them on safely so that they feared not but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. In what sense were they like sheep? Well, you know when they plundered Egypt they didn't come out with the irons of chariot, the chari you know, the iron chariots that they had there, did they? Or he didn't like supernaturally give them the skill of valiant warriors, did he? They came out defenseless. If it was just man for man, they'd have never come out of Egypt. It was God who wrought the deliverance. And, and that's the way he leads you too. In some ways, brethren, you do not stand a chance toe to toe against the wicked one. That's the manner of God's deliverances. He delivers you while you remain defenseless so that he is your only defense. Well, if Jesus is going to die for men, that's how it has to be. It's got to be defenseless. This is also why it is so serious when hirelings depart from the fold. 
because they are, in essence, defenseless. So he says, he that is an hireling and is not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, and seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. I'll tell you, I don't want to be standing on the day of judgment not having given defense to the people of God through my proclamation. But false shepherds do this, and this is what indicts against them, because sheep are defenseless, and their only defenses come from God as they're built up by the faith of Christ Jesus. See, this is how sheep, this is how this word is used in the scripture. So when we look at this term, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the, the sins of the world, we are in fact looking at one who has made himself, by, by his own volition, defenseless and vulnerable so that he could die on our behalf. This is a great truth to see. Isaiah 53, 7 says it this way of our Lord. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. You know, Jesus hasn't always been defenseless. He hasn't always been defenseless. Certain occasions, Jesus could raise up a question and silence men by a question. Uh, whose son is David? Just shut him down. This was not hard for Jesus. On other occasions, he could just walk through the crowd. No problem. There was no problem at all for Jesus to do this. Jesus was never taken by any man. Was it? Never taken off guard by their plots. Never. Huh? Could simply write, it, write some things in the sand and just turn the whole trap into just a halted plan. Just couldn't happen. But when it came to dying to fulfill the will of God, Jesus did not open his mouth. You know, this is one of the things that was so astounding to Pilate. Do you not know how many things they witnessed against you? And yet he opened not his mouth. This is the very thing that moved Pilate to threaten him. Do you not know that I have power to deliver you up or to release you? And then Jesus says, well... You'd have no power except that it had been given you from heaven. What was he? He was a sheep. He was defenseless before his enemies by choice. And he opened not his mouth. Scripture says that he was crucified through weakness. Crucified through weakness. Again, a self-imposed weakness. Remember that night when they came, they came to get him with Judas. Jesus said, who do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth, he says, I am he. Remember, they fell back. It's kind of, kind of Jesus' way of letting you know, nobody takes my life. Hmm? Yeah. Remember that very night, Peter, in his love to the master, took his sword, cut off Malchus's ear in defense of the Savior. Peter said, or Jesus said, put your sword away. Hmm? Whoever lives by the sword dies by the sword. Do you not know that I could presently... Ask 12 legion of my father, and he would give it to me. I mean, right now. This thing would be over. Why didn't he do that? How shall the scriptures be fulfilled? He is being the Lamb of God, defenseless and not opening his mouth. He is not going to defend himself here. That's our Savior. Now, the thing to me that is so edifying in this, I received this earlier this week, and it was so marvelous to see this. This humiliation, we call the humiliation of Christ, Philippians chapter 2 talks about his humiliation, is one of the clearest pictures, demonstrations of Jesus' love to his Father. It's one thing for you to be made humble. You ought to be humble. Hmm? It's another thing for he that was God in the beginning, for him to humble himself as to be taken by men who we might call our grasshoppers, just. But here's what you want to see. He did so because of his understanding that this was, in fact, the will of the living God. Amen. Remember his wrestling in the garden? That's part of, brother, brethren, that's part of him being a sheep, is his absolute dependence upon the Father to be guided and directed by him. And when it became absolutely certain to Jesus that there was no other way and that this was most assuredly 
the will of God, he set his face steadfastly toward his accusers and his persecutors and told his disciples, get up, let's go. Hmm? And in the process of this, your sins are being removed because it is the will of God that it be so. So brethren, in a sense, Jesus shows us the most preeminent picture of brotherly love. Brotherly love is first love to God and then love to the brethren secondarily. Hmm? And here's where you find great confidence at this table. Because when it comes to this table, preeminent in the heart of Jesus is the will of the Father. And his will is, in fact, your salvation. So, brethren, I encourage you to take great confidence in here. You know, there's a lot of the will of God there that is yet to be fulfilled and accomplished. But Jesus is steadfastly fixed to see that it is done. And if you ever wonder about Jesus' love for the Father, come again to Calvary. Amen. See his great humility. See him not open his mouth before Pilate. And being willing to go through this judgment of God, when at any moment he could have averted it, but he didn't. And be thankful. For this is the love of God that is so marvelous in our eyes. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you so much.